How many of you have actually written security rules for your Firebase real-time database application? One. There is one hand up. OK, then this talk, this, this talk will actually be useful to many of you. So I'm going to do a quick recap of that for those of you that didn't raise any hands. Um, then I'm going to introduce you to the crew on our voyage tonight who have written an app they use to divvy the loot from their halls. And that app is actually going to be attacked, but we're going to learn a lot from it, both from an outsider and then from an insider. So let's get this voyage on. So first, let's talk a little bit about Firebase. Firebase is really cool. I like Firebase a lot. It's fun. Um, and Firebase means to solve this kind of problem. A lot of us do a lot of front-end work, whether it be on mobile apps or web apps. And we're pretty slick with it. We're pretty fast. But if we have a cool application we want to write, what we often find is we're in a situation like this, where we spend a good chunk of our time writing back-end stuff. Um, either we have to get back-end friends, or for full stack, we have to put an inordinate amount of our time working on making sure the back-end can scale to a wildly successful mobile or web app. Maybe we'll pull some APIs in, and it will be awesome. Um, but the downside of this model is it gives us a lot of flexibility, but it doesn't really like allow us to spend all our time on the part we know best. And that's where Firebase comes in. Firebase makes it so that generally you don't have to spin up any back-end stuff, kind of like serverless, um, or a minimal amount of back-end stuff to get your job done. It gives you pre-rolled back-end components and some handy-dandy um, client libraries that integrate super well with them to keep you moving fast and productive on your application development. The way I like to think about it is it is a big old chest of goodies for doing your application development. All of them are super valuable on their own, uh, but they also work together super well. Um, you get you know, a 1 plus 1 plus 3 effect going on. And here's a big chart with all sorts of different goodies on there. There's all sorts of goodies um, that handle stuff that you would otherwise have to kind of like rewrite on your own every time you rolled a new app, like crash reporting and storage and messaging and app indexing and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole bunch of different goodies um, that you can use. And you can use just one. Um, but I don't have time to talk about all of those tonight. So we're just going to home in on a couple in my little loot dividing sample app. Specifically, we're going to talk about authentication and the Firebase real-time database. So let's take a couple minutes to zoom in on both of those. First, let's talk about authentication. Because if you want to write something that has like security, you have to kind of know who's using it, who they are. Um, so let's talk about auth, everyone's favorite topic to talk about over beers in the evening, right? <laughs> yeah, rolling your own auth is kind of a pain. Um, has anyone ever rolled like their own OAuth backend before? A couple people. How about like an OAuth integration with a social media provider? A few more hands. Is it fun? I, no one ever nods to this. It's a kind of a pain. And that's where, where Firebase's auth libraries come in handy. We already have pre-existing backends to do a lot of the, the, the OAuth bounces and that kind of stuff. And tight client library integration so that if you're using a social media login provider, our social login provider like Google or Facebook or Twitter, it's just a matter of copying a few identifiers around and you get it and it's great. It also supports other authentication methods like login and password and we take care of storing your passwords so you don't have to worry about using the right hashing and all that fun stuff. Um, you can also integrate with existing single sign-ons, all that kind of stuff. Even authenticate with phone numbers. That's our newest version of authentication. And it doesn't matter which one of those providers you use or if you roll your own. Um, they all boil down to a single kind of like unique Firebase identifier. So you can mix and match and still have an idea of who is using your app. And it's great. It makes authentication a lot easier because it's, it's, never, it's never fun. So might as well make it fast. OK, enough authentication. Let's talk about something more fun, the Firebase real-time database. This is actually the very first feature of Firebase from way back in the day. Um, and it is my favorite feature um, because it makes building apps super fast and super fun. So the way it works is think about all of the data, all of the different data in your application. as kind of a big old ball of JSON, like this, in the sky. It's a big old ball of JSON in the sky. And it's the kind of the whole pool of data for your web application. And 
your different clients can write to specific locations. So for example, like in this schema, I have like a different area for each one of the halls we did. So all of the gold we got from those halls when we, we pillaged the town or whatever. And all of our pirates also have a user profile with like their number of peg legs, their leadership status, how much gold they have on their profile, that kind of stuff. The gold they'll have when they finish the voyage. Um, so yeah, so each client can write to the specific location that makes sense for them. And then all the clients can subscribe to the parts of that big old ball of JSON that they care about. And then Firebase takes care of the other parts. So what happens is whenever that part of that big old ball of JSON, those subtrees or those queries against subtrees are updated, we'll call a function in your code and you can ch update the user interface or react as is appropriate. Which means that you don't have to take care of handling with a whole bunch of background threads. You don't have to take care of cache invalidation. Um, like the client libraries will even catch you up to the current if like there's a network interruption and stuff like that, which is kind of a pain to deal with on your own. It's really cool and it's kind of slick, it's fun. But we only have time for a preview of that today. Let's move on in our voyage. Let's talk about the crew tonight and one of their foes. Here's our crew. We have Boring Bob. Boring Bob's a pirate. He's a cool pirate. He hangs out. He's pretty chill, does a great job. We have Near Miss Nix, who is known for never missing, never near missing, always hitting. She's pretty violent, terrible person. But she's also a great app developer. She actually wrote our application. <laughs> and then, of course, we have Cap'n Jen. Um, which is me, because I'm doing the talk, so I get to be the captain. <laughs> and their bitter enemy, Parrot Pete, known for his many, 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 far too many parrots. Kind of like a crazy cat lady of pirate land. <laughs> and he's the mortal enemy of our crew. So now that we've talked about the crew, let me talk to you or show you the app that our crew has written to divide up the loot. So I'm going to whoop, exit out of here and minimize some of these windows and then just show you one window of the app. Which one is it? I think it's the one I just closed. So I'm logged in as a bunch of different users. Shocking. OK, so here is the app. Um, it's a very, very, very simple app. Let me make it bigger so you can actually see on the screen. Boop, boop, giant. OK, so it's a pretty simple app. You log in and then you get to see, you see two big old buttons if you are authenticated as a leader. You get to see how much loot you have. I'm the captain, so I have 10,000 gold doubloons. Um, I can also go back to the main menu, and if we have recently done a haul, it will show up in this list. We've recently pillaged a ship or a village. I can click on that tiny town without a name that we pillaged, and I can divide up the loot as is appropriate. I'll give Nix, 20, I'll give Bob 4, and I can give myself the balance, uh, which is like 176 or something like that. That seems appropriate. I can divvy it up. So it's a pretty simple application, but it has a lot of the kind of functionality you're going to expect a larger application to have. It has like features that are locked to, to access to certain users. Um, it has kind of transactional stuff moving around, stuff like that. And let's talk a little bit about how we'd like to control access to that. So we have a sign-in page, so we can use that to authenticate users. I accidentally already logged in, and I have not yet implemented a sign-out button, but users sign in. Um, anyone, even Pirate Pete, could discover this URL and get to the sign-in page in our app. We have the main menu, which we only want to really operate for members of our crew, so Bob, Nix, and myself then we want any pirate on the crew to be able to see their own stash of gold so that they know how much is waiting for them when our voyage ends. And then we want leaders of the crew, which is only me because I'm the captain. Um, but if I were to recruit lieutenants, they might also have access to the leadership control. Um, we want them to be able to divvy up loot to all of the other members of the crew. Okay, so that's kind of a, a rough idea of philosophically what we want. But we didn't pay much attention to actually implementing that. So let's see what happens in the real world when we do it. What's going to happen when Pete finds out that we're managing our ledgers with this, this insecure application? Because you see, what happened was when Nix was writing that app, she 
um, was like packing it together and she just wanted it to work now. And Firebase Real-Time Database has some default security rules, but she went in and turned them off. And the way you turn them off is by setting all the read and write rules for the entire real-time database, the entire ball of JSON, to true. And what that means is when anybody lands on any part of the app or tries to make any call, it's always going to evaluate as they are allowed. So, let me see. Ah. What happens? So the thing is that Firebase in addition to be having client libraries for writing your mobile and web applications, it also has a REST interface. And because it is completely open to the world, Pirate Pete doesn't even need to know the URL of our application. He just needs to know the URL of where it is. So let me show you what happens when Pirate Pete discovers that he can just do a curl request to yeah. our API. So let me pull up the console. So here is... Boop, here is the data, the console, the, like the database console for our little application with all of our data on it. This is the live data. And Pirate Pete is just going to do a, a HTTP put request of nothing to the root of our real-time database. And what will happen is all of our data will disappear in real time. Um, but it's OK. All of the apps stopped working, and we pinged Nix. And Nix is like, I have a backup. I don't know what happened. but we can import that data and just get, get going again. So we'll pull in the data, we'll import, and we'll end up back where we were with the most recent stashes uh, divided. But it doesn't really stop there, because in addition to using curl to do it, Pete could land on our login page, and without even, um, having, without even hitting the login button, can use the newly discovered Chrome developer tools pop up in the console, and then run some Firebase commands, because the Firebase client is already loaded. Um, so let me just go grab, rather than type, I will grab them from here. So what, what Pete can do is use the Firebase client to look at the root of our database and then tell Firebase that he is interested in knowing what is in the entire ball of JSON, the entire. So doing a listening event on the root of our entire database. And what happens is Pete can see everything, all of our halls, all of the balances of all of our pirates, and how many peg legs everyone has. And that's a big bummer, because he can use it to time his attacks with cannons. And that would be sad. And in addition to that, Pete can also do write attacks. He can, he can set the database to null using our own client library from the login page. And sure enough, back in the other tab, all of our data is gone once again. Our app crashes, we wake up Nix, make her import all the data again, um, but there's, it's obvious something is seriously wrong. So let's boop, bring that back. Yay. Well, because Pete was still listening, we sent Pete an update in real time. The data's back. <laughs> So yes, Pete can even use the debug tools to, to cause us lots of pain. So of course, the solution to this is to swing the pendulum as far as possible the other way. So one thing Nix could do is set all of them to false and deny access to everyone to all of the data. Because when you have like a serverless database like this is exposed to the internet, why not just lock everything down? Unfortunately, that was a little too aggressive, and that makes the app break for everyone, because now nobody has access to any of the data, and the app needs that to operate. And security is often about finding that middle zone between things work and things are not working too well for people we don't want them to work well for. Oh, and, and incidentally, because of the way Firebase rules work, if you just say false everywhere, that's actually the default behavior. So if you just, this is the same as having no security rules at all. The real-time database defaults to nobody has access. So this is when Nix remembered that there was something in these security rules when she started writing her app that she ignored completely and just threw away. It was these. These are the default security rules. And what they do is they use a built-in variable, the auth variable. And what it does is this essentially says, whoops, that I will knock down the lights. What it does essentially is it um, gives everybody access gives anybody who's an authenticated user access to any of the data in the database. So this actually solves our problem a little bit um, in that it um, restricts access to anybody that we've never heard of before. Like, you know, most of the internet, random worms and like botnets. 
um, will not be able to like randomly stumble upon posting null to our database and wiping it out, which is good. So Nix is going to go ahead and apply those rules to our database. So I'm going to copy them from my notes. We're going to go over to this editor for the security rules. We're going to paste them in, and we're going to publish them. But alas, Pirate Pete has found a way around it already. So in another tab, Pete is already logged in. Pete logged in on the button. Because what this does is it doesn't restrict this to authenticated users we're familiar with. This restricts it to any authenticated user on the internet. So if you just leave the default settings there, you're, you're probably safe from like a botnet or some, some random request flying in. But somebody who knows to go register a Gmail account and log in can still cause trouble. So the same um, request still works. So popping up the, oops, let me reload that. Um, popping up the um, uh, Chrome developer tools again, we can use the same request we did before. So they go back, I can even just copy this right from there, paste it into the logged in as Pete browser, show us a real-time database, and still cause it to all go red and vanish. Sadness continues. So import the data again. Banish the sadness, yes. Nix is getting kind of tired of that. Which means it's time to actually start reading the documentation and figuring out how these security rules actually work. This is a good time to do it after having done three emergency restorations. And reading the rules, Nix discovers that it's an incredibly expressive language for security. In fact, like the security rules behind the Firebase Real-Time Database are actually what makes it a usable product. Without it, you wouldn't really be able to just leave your data exposed to the internet. That's crazy. Um, and one of the really cool features of this rules language is you can create rules that are expressions that can, can have data um, that refers to any other location in your real-time database. So what Nix notices is the data is already in there. Remember, there's a profile blob for each one of the pirates in the crew. And those are all organized by their unique Firebase identifier. I wonder if we could use this to restrict access to just pirates we know are members of our crew. And it turns out we can. We can write a security rule like this, where we evaluate and every time a read or a write request comes in, we will evaluate this expression. And what this expression will do is it will look to see, um, it'll look to see if the currently authenticated user's identifier is within the list of, um, uh, is a child of the pirates. So if we look at our data, whoop, what that looks like here is it's going to take the user identifier um, uh, that comes in from the authenticated user, and it's going to check this entire set of all known pirates. And if it sees, if it gets any match on anyone in this list, any of these identifiers, it will allow the read or the write event, which is great. It now restricts us to just members of our crew. So let's go ahead and update those security rules in the little browser version and get rid of the attack code. We're going to publish it. And then we will notice that if Pete tries to do an attack again, he will be thwarted. Permission denied, which is great when it's not you getting it, when it's the enemy. Um, so yes, we have been Victorious? Yes, we've stopped the outsider threat. We now have restricted access to just the bare minimum of authenticated users. We know that only crew can use our applications or just randomly interact with our database outside of, of you know, the user interface of our, of our app. Pete has been vanquished. But that's not really what like, security policies are about. There's another big part about it. You can't just have a crunchy shell on the outside and then hope that everybody inside is going to behave well. Because then maybe Pete pays off Bob or something like that. We could still have serious trouble. And that may be exactly what happens. Bob might want to redistribute that swag when he's noticing those piles of gold in those halls sure exceed the amount he has in his bank account by a lot. Uh, oops. Got it. Okay, so we want to start 
further restricting the data within our own database. So this is a little snapshot of our real-time database. We have our hulls, we have our pirate profile blobs. And let's kind of take us a piecewise approach to this. The first thing we want to try and do is write security rules that restrict our most confidential information, which is how much we actually got from each one of our hulls. We want to restrict that to just our leaders. Oh, and then after that, oh, and it turns out we actually already have another field, because remember, we can refer to any other location in the real-time database to accomplish this. And we already have an is leader flag on each one of our pirate profiles. In this case, this is showing that either Nix or Bob is not the leader. But my profile, um, JSON Bob, would show that I am a leader. Yay! And we can write a security rule that will do this also. So we can write a rule that does a read and write block on what it does is when um, the authenticated user makes a read or write request, I'm going to go navigate from the root of the real time database, look at all of the pirates, find the one that matches the currently logged in user, check the is leader flag, get the value, and then verify that it's true. But there is a problem with this. We still have our old security rule above here. And one of the things about security rules on the real-time database is that they cascade when true. So true values cascade down. Because like, essentially, if we're looking at this, anyone in the crew has access to the entire database. So what the, what's the point of blocking just a smaller chunk? It, it doesn't do anything. They can just move up one step and get the whole thing. Firebase knows that, so it just grants access anyway. Truths cascade down. Falses do not cascade. So once something has been set to true, you cannot add a false further down the tree. So we need to adjust our rules to compensate. And this is where um, one of the other parts of the security rules language comes in handy, which is that you can have wildcards. So here I'm saying that I want this rule on just halls. Um, but here, down below, I say dollar sign other. And if you prefix one of these paths with a dollar sign, it becomes a variable and will match anything in there, anything that's not already matched. So this rule, we take our old um, all, all, all pirates, all members of the pirate crew, and we give them access to the rest of the real-time database using a wildcard. Ta-da! So does that give us victory? Kind of, but we've only solved some of the data access problem. Because although they can't see the whole hall, our pirates can still peek in on each other's bank balances, which results in a Bob who is still jealous that the gen has taken all the money, um, and, and hijinks may happen. So let's further restrict this. So what we want to do here is we want to have a pirate profile, peg leg, eye patch count, parrot population, and we want to take those and we want to make it readable to everyone else in the, um, in the crew, but we only want pirates to be able to change their own profiles, because otherwise really silly hijinks will happen and fights may break out. We also want to make sure that only pirates can see their own pile of gold. So in this case, only Nix can see Nix's gold. And finally, the leadership flag is sitting out here in the open right now. Although I've locked down the amount of money in each hull, the leadership flag is still in the profile. So any pirate could go in there and just promote themselves to a leader and then access all the hull. That, that's a problem also. So we want to make sure that only Jen can access that leadership flag. So remember um, that true values cascade down, false values do not cascade. And one of the kind of the implications of this is that if you have a single object, it's hard to restrict access to just part of it. You end up, you can actually do it, but you end up with these enormous security rules. Um, there's an easier way, and that is to take the data that you want to selectively control access to and break it out into separate objects. So we had some of the fields of the pirate profile, and what we've done is we've kind of copied them into different root nodes. The leadership flag is now an entry in a leaders list, and the pirate loot has been moved off into its own node. So that allows us to restrict access on each one of those root nodes individually. We can restrict access to just the leaders um, to the leadership flagging using the same rules that we use for halls. Uh, the pirate loot, we can make simple rules that'll just restrict access to the specific pirate. So they're the only ones who can either see or modify their loot values. And then finally, um, 
Pirates, we want everyone to be able to see each other's profiles, but not modify them. They can only modify their own. So this is the rule set that we end up building out. So let's go ahead and apply this to our Firebase, and I will walk you through the rules. So we go, oh yeah, first we have to flatten our data. So I'm going to import some data that I flattened using another tool. So here's our flattened data. It is the same data, except now leaders have been broken out and pirate loot has been pulled out also into its own root node, giving us four root nodes. And this is a pattern you'll see when you're writing more complicated applications, you may end up with many, many, many root nodes. And that is okay. A lot of people are afraid of that for some reason. The other implication is that as you build out your application, you may end up with a lot of listeners you're creating and destroying. You may end up with hundreds of listeners in a web app. That's OK. Listeners are cheap. So listeners are kind of the, the, the idea behind, I want to listen to this specific path. Because each one of these paths, um, um, I may end up creating a separate listener for. OK, so we've done that. We want to apply our big old rule set. And then I'm going to walk you through it after I publish it. So the first thing is the hull's path, the big piles of money we just got from those shipwrecks and stuff. This one, um, we're going to take the currently authenticated user's ID number, or ID identifier string, and we're going to make sure that they are in the list of known leaders. And we'll restrict both read and write access that way. So now, hulls should be locked down. The leadership node is locked down with the exact same rule. Um, we want to make sure that only leaders can promote or demote other leaders. Otherwise, we have you know, the, the sysadmin paradox, where the sysadmin has every, every privilege, because they can always grant it to themselves. Um, then, pirate loot. This one, um, because each pirate has their own bucket of loot, we're going to use the wild card like we did before, but in a slightly different way. One of the cool parts about the wild cards is that they are available to any rule further down the rule chain as a variable. So whatever value this wild card matched is available as something you can use in your expression further down, which allows you to write more sophisticated rules. I think this is actually what puts the rule language over. This is one of the pieces that allows the rule language. It's actually Turing complete. You can actually write stuff into the rules language, um, which people have done. But don't, don't try and do that. It, it gets messy. Um, but anyway, so this ends up being the identifier of the pirate profile that this read or write request refers to. And what we want to make sure is that that matches the currently logged in user. So if, I, if Nix tries to modify Bob's profile, this will result in false, because they're not the same. If Bob tries to modify Bob's profile, it will resolve to true. Then we have one rule left down here, which is pirates. In this one, we wanted different levels of access to the pirate profiles. We want the read one. We want pirates to be able to read all of the profiles. So we put that rule one step up on the pirates node. And it's very similar to the rule we have above, whereas if the um, currently authenticated user is a known pirate on our crew, they can do read. But write access is limited, if the limited to the currently logged in user um, can only modify their own profile, just like we have for the pirate loot node. So if those published we can actually use a really cool tool. So I've been demonstrating it before using the, like, the hacker technique of sending requests in with curl or with um, like Chrome developer tools. And these will work. Like It'll tell you when permission is denied or, or approved. But it's like this is the, you know, the, the, the front of the wall. And we're not going to tell you details about why you can't access it, because that would just be too easy for the hackers. That's no fun. The simulator, though, we know you're trusted. And you can simulate requests, and it will tell you a lot about what goes on. But it's a little bit bigger, so let me make the screen bigger. And let's test a few requests and see how well they work. Um, what's cool is you can also simulate writes from a specific user without going into a login flow. So I can go back here, and I, for example, I can grab a Bob's user identifier, boop, go on into the simulator, and then I can see if Bob can read from the halls. Can Bob read from the halls? So hopefully, this will say no. And yes, Bob was denied. But what about, what about me? I'll grab my user identifier, Captain Jen, who should have access. And we can check that as well. If we run that in it, hey, I am allowed access. So it's working. It's giving access to the right user. 
Um, we could also just, this is kind of good to go through a sanity check of a few different things. Like, we probably want to see if, if um, I, as Captain Jen, can modify Bob's profile. So let's go grab Bob's ID again, go back on over, and we're going to look at pirates slash Bob's identifier. And I should not have read access. Or I should have read access. Yes, I should have read access so I can see how many peg legs Bob has. But I should not be able to change it because that would be mean. And sure enough, and what's, this is where it actually starts to get cool, is not only does it tell you um, whether you were denied or granted, it also tells you the rule that impacts it. So when I tried to do a write, I was denied access by this rule down here on line 25, whereas when I did a read, I was granted access by this rule on line 22, which doesn't seem that exciting in our simple application, but as your apps get more complicated, so do your rules. And this is a very good way to trace a problem when you are denied or granted access and you're not exactly sure why. Cool. So with that, our rules are done. Our application is secure enough to continue to use it and continue our voyage and pillage more ships. So we've had a victory. We can celebrate with some grog, as all pirates do. And we learned some lessons along the way. The first lesson is, please use security rules if you're using the real-time database. Like, it's important, as we discovered, how easy it was for Parrot Pete to come and just totally mess with our app. Like, we recovered it from a backup, but we probably lost some data in that. That's a bummer. So definitely do use them. The other thing to realize is that the security rules can impact the way you structure your data. We had to rearrange our data. When we did that, we had to change some of our front-end code to accommodate that change in structure. So do it early. The earlier you make these changes, the less pain you're going to have to deal with later. And finally, uh, the simulator is awesome. It makes this development a lot easier. Um, building stuff out with these security rules is, is, like, is a lot easier because of tooling like this. So use them. They're fun. They're awesome. And they make Firebase like, actually work in a production environment. Because all the cache and validation handling and all that is cool, but like, you need to be able to restrict access to your authorized users. And it has it. And it's a great way of implementing it. I think it's fun anyway. So thank you all very much for sitting through my tale of a pirate adventure. Um, thanks so much.